At the present time, there are a number of different strategies for the dealing with complexity. One of these is reductionism. That's the traditional approach of Western science since the 17th century. It says that the way to understand the system is to know well what it's made of, to understand the parts. And if you understand the parts, then it's rather straightforward to put them together and see how they behave. A second strategy is a kind of democracy of numbers. That's a statistical approach. What it says is, let us not think theoretically about a problem. Let's let the numbers speak. And so what you do is measure everything and do regression analysis, correlation analysis, all the tools of biostatistics. And what you come out with at the other end are regression coefficients. It tells you associations between variables. It could also be misleading in, in some ways. And you warned at the beginning of a biostat course that correlation is not the same as causation. We saw in examining the predator-prey relation or any other kind of negative feedback that two variables might be linked in a negative feedback. And this could give you either a positive correlation or a negative correlation or no correlation at all depending on where the rest of the world enters the system. If it enters by way of the predator um, or the insulin uh, or production, uh, then it can generate a negative correlation. If it enters by way of the uh, prey, it generates a positive correlation. Now, one, one outcome of this is the inconsistency that you get in meta-analysis. Now, meta-analysis is the examination of a large number of studies of ostensibly the same problem. There'll be studies done in different centers. Let's say they'll all be dealing with the question, does DDT increase the vulnerability to cancer? Well, what a meta-analyst does is look at all of these studies and start out by weeding them out and deciding that some of these we won't even deal with, uh, we don't like the design, or it didn't have a large enough sample, or we simply don't trust those people, um, or it's written in Japanese and we don't know Japanese. Uh, so there's, a, there's the initial weeding. Sometimes if the results are, are very different from the results of other studies, you simply declare it an outlier and throw it away. Then you have the remaining set of studies, and what you do is average their results in some way. <coughs> and that will tell you whether a factor seems to be significantly correlated, associated with some other factor. And you say yes or no. If you deal with the dynamics and recognize things like negative feedback, it leads you to a somewhat different kind of approach. Then let's come back to the question, does DDT cause cancer? So one thing you might do is take blood samples in different populations and look at the cancer rates and ask, do the people who have higher concentrations of DDT in their blood also have <coughs> higher cancer rates? So you expect uh, that there's a positive correlation then between the carcinogen <coughs> and the cancer. And this makes, this, this makes it a rough kind of plausible sense. But now let's consider a different interpretation of that same network. Let us suppose that people differ in their vulnerability to cancer. That some, uh, for genetic or physiological reasons, that some tissues in, the, in, in, in some people uh, absorb the cancer, have the active sites on the cells where the, where the carcinogen can attach. So then you, the pathway is still that the DDT is causing the cancer by being taken up by these tissues, but it gets removed from the blood. So then in people who are less vulnerable, there's more, more DDT in the blood and less cancer, while those who have the cancer have less DDT in the blood because they absorb it into the tissues, thus generating the cancers. So he asked, well, in one, in one population, people differ by the amount of exposure to DDT. And therefore, the external world is entering our analysis 
by way of the DDT, and the DDT is acting as the prey here. It's the resource, so the more DDT, the more cancer, and you'd expect a positive correlation. In other populations, people differ by their vulnerability, by their exposure to environmental factors of other sorts, by disease, by their immune systems. And so what happens here is that uh, you're dealing with people who differ in their vulnerability to the cancer or the amount of cancer, and the more vulnerable or the more cancerous, the less BDT in the blood. So there'll be an inconsistency between these studies and a meta-analysis. What you do then is average, and it, it comes to the conclusion in this particular case that there's no evidence that EDT causes cancer. In some populations, and these are divided by ethnicity, so in some populations, it, it turned out, for instance, that I think that among Asian American women, there was a negative correlation. Among Afro Americans, it was positive. And the ethnicity doesn't matter here so much as they, the fact that these populations were observed at different times in the development of cancer uh, or in other kinds of circumstances that were not controlled for. So we warn that in a meta-analysis, don't throw away the variability by averaging. When there are separate studies which separately give significant results, but opposite results, then you start looking at the feedback structure and ask, Usually, there's a negative feedback involved that can give you this kind of inconsistency. 